You guys have heard myself and Danny talk, you know, wax poetic about the running back position. We decided to get a running back expert on the channel here, a guy that won millions in Best Ball Mania 3, a guy that, you know, is made famous for legendary upside, a guy that can break down running backs like nobody's business. Let me introduce you guys, if you haven't checked out his work already, to Pat Corain, legendaryupside.com is where you can find him. Twitter uh, will be linked on the screen there and, and down below in the description. We're going to break down the article that you, you know, tend to write mostly every year. You outline the legendary running back scenarios, how these guys smash, how these guys miss, and all that good stuff. So, Pat, introduce yourself to the people, and let's uh, – let's. I'm, I'm fired up for this. Let's get right into it. Yeah, I am too. Uh, so the article that I write, uh, it breaks down the legendary scenarios, the scenarios where these running backs – win you your league like single-handedly like todd Gurley 2017 christian mccaffrey 2019 that kind of outcome the, the kind of outcome we got from austin eckler last year who can actually do that put together the efficiency the volume needed uh score a ton of touchdowns all of that stuff uh this is an article that is written for managed ppr leagues is kind of what it's driven towards um it's certainly helpful for other formats uh best ball as well but that's kind of the the main driver of it is kind of your managed leagues um and yeah go through and i the way i write it is i actually outline the scenario i travel to the future and i i tell you exactly what's going to happen to how the each running back can hit these really high thresholds but the type of thresholds that we do see about a player maybe two hit every single season and i feel very strongly that if you're drafting a running back in the first couple rounds this is the type of profile that you should be looking for. If you don't hit this profile, it actually hurts a lot more than it might seem. You end up with last year's Najee Harris or Dalvin Cook. You're getting beaten by the wide receivers you could have had instead. If you end up with last year's Austin Eckler, though, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I do a similar kind of exercise on our channel where I look at like the anatomy of a league winning running back, which to me is a 20 plus point per game score. So it's a, a tad bit of a different threshold. But, you know, when we're looking at running backs that can achieve like high receptions, you have it listed here as four per game, you know, green zone touches, guys that are involved in the goal line, high carry volume type of guys, you know, players that are on uh, ideally great offenses who are heavily involved and heavily featured in that offense and all that good stuff. That's basically something that I want to find out because I think, you know, the when you examine the old seasons, and I believe you did like 36 for this article, it's it, it gives you a roadmap to determine like who actually has this kind of upside because the word upside is so overused in the fantasy space that it's impossible to know what that even means if you don't actually define what it means and how you can actually get to those type of seasons. I mean, famously, people on this channel know that we are very much, you know, we only draft running backs early in the in the draft that have high upside. Otherwise we're, you know, doing a hero RB. We take one shot and then we move on to the wide receiver quarterback and tight end position. We run a zero RB if none fall to us, that kind of thing. So in managed leagues, this can be, like you said, very powerful because a lot of people do have the mindset of, I'm just going to take my safe RB one production. I'm going to use him. He's going to get the touches that he needs to get. And if I get the RB nine in points per game, I'm totally happy with that. But like you kind of just alluded to there, that sometimes does more harm than good. Yeah, and I think so. I illustrated this with best ball win rates in the article um, and talk about this idea of silent killers, which is the idea that these guys who kind of chug along and, and they have, you know, a healthy season, but they never really do all that much for your team. They're actually really big. Uh, they, they drag your rosters down. And I use best ball win rates because it's so much easier to like have the data for that because the guys stay on the roster all season and all the players drafted stay on rosters all season. So it's kind of easier to figure out like who's impacting teams. But I, I think it's even worse to have one of these guys in managed in the article. I use the example of Derrick Henry in 2021 versus Ezekiel Elliott where, or is 2020. Yeah. 2021 where Derrick Henry played eight games. He averaged 23 points per game, but then he got hurt and his best ball win rate was almost as good as Ezekiel Elliott's. And keep in mind that those teams didn't have a chance to drop Derrick Henry and pick up someone else. They didn't have a chance to get points off the waiver wire at running back and put them into their lineup the way you can in a managed league. In a managed league, you would so much rather have a guy who crushes for you. And then unfortunately you can't use him for, you know, some stretch, but you can backfill that production and Zeke, who was putting up like 14, 15 points per game, 
you're probably just putting them in your lineup every week and it's not moving the needle for you. You're not actually looking for other options. Maybe you're actually missing out on some of those break those waiver wire breakouts because you think you're set at running back when you're really not. And it actually hurts you quite a bit more than it might may, may seem. And you know, Najee Harris uh and Dalvin Cook were really the big examples of that last year. Uh looking at the best ball stuff, Harris, Harris's teams made uh the playoffs on underdog at just an eight percent rate. That's about half of what you would have expected. Uh, Cook's underdog advance rate was 41% below expected. So when you get these guys that, again, played 17 games, but just never really become like difference makers at the position, what happens is you can't keep up with the wide receivers around you, especially as running backs start to fall later in the draft where you're able to get like a Josh Jacobs or a Tony Pollard or a Mondre Stevenson later in the draft. Those wide receiver early teams, they're like maybe even – better at running back than you are with a Dalvin cook or an Najee Harris. Yeah. It's pretty crazy that like when we look at the whole wide receiver landscape versus the running back landscape, like when I started playing fantasy football, like if you didn't draft two running backs in the first two rounds, like you were screwed at the position and there was nobody else to speak of, but now we're seeing, you know, the way that the, the ADP has corrected itself due in part to sites like underdog fantasy and, you know, the data that we have available, because not only, like you said, are these players on the roster the whole time, it's also paid leagues. If there's no noise in the data, on like yeah. ESPN ADP where people are drafting kickers and defenses in the eighth, ninth round that completely skew the way that the data looks. So yeah, it's in, you're also only outlining one scenario. Like the silent killer scenario is when I did the, the whole like early round running back strategy, when I looked at the top 20 running backs in ADP since 2015, I called it like just fine. The guys that like, you know, they're drafted RB six, they finish RB 12. They didn't kill you, but they, you know, weren't terrible. But like you were suggesting, they probably did kill you to some degree. Um, the other scenarios are that running backs get injured, right? They get injured at a high rate. Yeah. yeah. Since 2015, they suffer six or more game injuries. So like serious injuries, long-term injuries that affect their entire season at a near 20% rate. So like one in five running backs are suffering an injury since 2015 at that kind of rate. And also too, like the guys that are outright busting because, you know, for whatever reason, the market was wrong on their projection or, you know, maybe their offense is terrible, whatever the case is, that's like another 21% rate too. So when you combine, when I looked at this, when you combine the just fine rate, the bust rate and the injury rate. So all of those are disappointment scenarios. You're looking at like 58.76% of the time running backs were not an asset to your team. You were better off taking a Travis Kelsey or a elite wide receiver, or, you know, this year, especially when you got those like mid uh, round quarterbacks, those high end quarterbacks in the mid second round or the, the early third round, you're better off taking guys like that. Yeah. I think that's, that's a huge part of it is the risk you're taking on when you go into the running back position. And when you draft a wide receiver, like it is not a risk-free proposition. Wide receivers bust too. They get hurt too, but it is safer. And generally the wide receivers being drafted early are better bets in PPR leagues to outscore the running backs around them. I think that's shifting a little bit this year. Certainly in best ball, things have gotten a little wide receiver heavy in, in managed leagues. I think things are, a little bit more kind of normal where the wide receivers, I think will probably outscore the running backs around them, except when a wide receiver doesn't score a running back around him, it's sometimes because that running back scores way more than the wide receiver. And I think that's like, sometimes I've seen work like, like when I started this a couple years ago, it was partly in response to stuff about like the average PPR scoring from the RB four is, and it's like the average is not what we're looking for here. The average is hiding the fact that a ton of these guys outright bust, as you just pointed out, but a few of them absolutely crush. And can we find those guys a little bit more reliably? Yeah, I think another underrated thing, I'm not sure if you touched on this in the article too, but I, I posted it or I'm going to post a video later today about like the differences in strategy and managed leagues versus like a 12 team league, a 14 team league, an eight team league you know, PPR standard, that kind of thing. When you look at the win rates and you adjust them for an eight man league or a 10 man league, the numbers become like a 31% win rate that Todd Gurley had in 2017 in an eight man league was near 50%. Like yeah. that, the, the stud value over replacement factor of having a guy like Todd Gurley, if you guys listening to this are in shallow leagues is even exponentially more than what we're talking about on the basis of like standard PPR 12 man formats as well. Yeah, because 
depth is not as much of a factor. Everyone's going to be as you know pretty pretty darn good fantasy teams. Uh, and then it's what can't you replace? You can't replace 2017 Todd Gurley. You it is impossible. Like there there was one 2017 Todd Gurley. You either had him or you didn't. Yeah, exactly. And even though we had great seasons from Antonio Brown that year and Rob Gronkowski that year, they were just they were simply not on the level win rate wise and value over replacement via the rest of their position. Like you said, the RB four on average in points per game, that's not going to catch a 2017 Todd Gurley season um, for sure. So um, one thing I also found very interesting because this applies directly to this season is one of the things that you have in your legendary running back target profile in the article is that you have, you know, you know, kind of uh, addendums made for young running backs. You have, you know, excluding rare prospect profiles remain very price sensitive on rookies. And of course, we have a pretty rare prospect profile rookie running back this year. Prioritize second year players and be skeptical on, you know, non second year players assuming a significant role increase. And I think one of the articles of the year was written by uh, Ryan Heath of Fantasy Points. He looked at the entire like landscape of like age relative to quarterback, running back, wide receiver, and tight end. And one thing that he found digging back to like year the year 2000 is that the breakout seasons for fantasy running backs, 38.5% of the time came as rookies, 30.8% of the time came as second year players. And then after those first two seasons, it drops all the way down to 15% for third year players, 5.8% for fourth year players, 7.7% for fifth year players. And then after that, it's like you, you can't break out if you haven't broken out at that point in time then you're probably not going to. So knowing that we have, you know, Bijan Robinson, Brees Hall, you know, even Kenneth Walker, like some of these guys that are first and second year running backs, Jameer Gibbs, of course, it's so interesting to me that, that the whole like running back landscape does matter uh, when it comes to age, because the way that we price these guys in, in ADP is if we're uncertain about their role, which in some cases we are about a guy like Brees Hall, we don't necessarily know how to price them. And that's where you can get the edge. And that's where you can achieve a high win rate because the market's concerned about where a guy is going. Yeah, I would say a couple things on the age. One is when I wrote this, I was surprised to see that there really wasn't a lot of like shifting in terms of how much receiving work these guys were getting later into their careers. You kind of saw like some sometimes guys would get a lot more of that work in year two. Right. Or you might see someone take on a big uh, workload increase in year two, like Christian McCaffrey did. But if you're betting on a guy, especially on the receiving side, I would say, like if you're betting on someone to like, hey, they're going to throw to him a lot more this year. And there's real reasons to think that it's not that someone can't get a few more receptions or even a lot more receptions like Derrick Henry, because the bar was so low, you know, over the last couple of years, he has been used more in the receiving game. But at the same time, he's still Derrick Henry. You know, it's still largely kind of the, the archetype that we're familiar with. And I would say usually there's a back or two that we start to project like a change in role a little bit on. And if we're doing that on a second year player, I'm definitely open to that. If we're doing that on a veteran, I think we should be pretty skeptical of it. Not that it can't happen, but if it's kind of driving the price, then that's a position that I want to be out on. I want to be, I want to be fading that if that's sort of priced in the other thing um, on age is that I was also surprised in just how young a lot of these legendary seasons were. And not just that a lot of them are coming from like second year backs, but they were really not coming from guys, even like 26 years old, like 26 is kind of old by the standards of producing an insanely productive fantasy season, right? If you need someone to access, oh my God, you had to have this guy, then it really helps if they're truly in the prime of their career, not kind of just, just past it. But, and we know, like we see with running backs, it ha it happens quick. The drop-offs are quick and they are massive. You know, a guy can go from like Dalvin Cook was a first round pick in 2022 and then he gets cut before the 2023 season. Like that's how quick this thing can happen. And so we, I definitely want to be like ahead of the curve on that in general, but especially if I'm betting on a guy who's, I think this guy's gonna be the very best running back in the entire league. It's really helpful if he's in his prime. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that. I've always said the like jargon that I would rather be a year too early on these guys than a year too late because a year too early means that I probably lost my fantasy league, sure, because I drafted a guy too high. 
but it's a one in 12 chance of winning a home league or a one in 10 chance yeah. if you're in a 10 man league or whatever. You're going to lose hard if you miss on a guy who has a legendary season either way. So you're either deciding to take that plunge like I'm willing to do, you know, in years past last year, perfect example for me was Javante Williams. I didn't necessarily think he had a legendary season, but I thought he had a real chance to to really break out. And we saw, you know, 21 targets over the first three games. Of course, he blows his knee out. And that's been yeah. pretty much a trend with all these young running backs. Any exciting young running back we get, it seems like in the last two years has pretty much uh, suffered a major injury with Brees and Javante and Dobbins and Akers, all these guys. So for me, I think it's really interesting when you when you think about the fact that how much you can gain an advantage on the market and how much um, you know age does factor in. Because I mean, like famously, like the top six running backs in ADP right now, Bijan Robinson is the only one who's not 26 or older, right? Christian McCaffrey, Austin Eckler, Nick Chubb, who's also a perfect example, by the way, of the like projecting a major receiving increase because Kareem Hunt is yeah. now gone. Aaron Jones was a perfect example of that last year because Jamal Williams left. Um, and then, you know, Saquon Barkley and Tony Pollard are barely 26, but they're also a little bit older as well. So it's really interesting, the dynamic of the running back position this year, because you're either betting on, you know, unknowns like Bijan Robinson, Brees Hall, Travis Etienne, Jameer Gibbs, all these guys, or you're betting on knowns, but do they still got it like Derrick Henry and, you know, those type of guys. And then you have, you know, mixed in a couple Jonathan Taylors and Josh Jacobs here and there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting year. I could see this being kind of a reset year at running back where the guys in like round four are the first round picks next year. And the guys that are going in the first couple rounds are largely fourth round picks or fifth round picks next year. Kind of like we saw with Aaron Jones, right? Aaron Jones is now kind of like a fourth, fifth type of pick. And he was a late second round pick last year. Yeah, it's, it's crazy because like you said, the running back position, even for like multi-time potential future Hall of Famers like Christian McCaffrey and Derrick Henry, like it can change really fast. And I've done, yes. you know, a, a study back in like March from like a dynasty perspective on the running back touch and AJ Pex and when running backs typically fall off and not just all running backs, like multi-time RB1 finishers. And the average ended up being 27 years old and over 1,150 career touches. I mean, Derrick Henry already has smashed that he's at 1900 career touches and he's like 29 years old. So maybe there's a chance that he's an outlier a la, you know, LaDainian Tomlinson, Adrian Peterson, guys like that. But at the same time, I mean, he, he's well over the number and so is Christian McCaffrey. So that's an interesting dynamic that I find myself fading a guy like Christian McCaffrey at the top of the draft for B. John Robinson or a wide receiver who's kind of ranked similarly like, uh, you know, Tyree Kill or Cooper Cup or somebody like that. So let's get into like the, the player takey stuff because in your uh, legendary upside running back article, you you do, like you said, travel to the future, outline the legendary scenarios for these guys. And then at the end of each section, you're like in managed leagues. Am I targeting these guys? Am I fading these guys? Um, did anything stick out? We don't necessarily need to go through like every single legendary scenario and that kind of thing. I want people to definitely check out the article and read those. But did anything stick out when you were doing this and any guys kind of pop? I would encourage people to check out the article. It's completely free. Uh, generally, my site... Uh, a lot of stuff's behind a paywall, but this is not. So if you want to uh, dive into all the scenarios, uh, it's it's right there for you to do that. Um, I, I well, We can start with Bijan. I mean, Bijan, it's one of the things I really like about this article, about doing it, is that like as I'm doing it, I feel like I get a better sense of what, what I should be doing in drafts. Because when you actually have to sit down and think through, okay, what does this – silent killer scenario look like where they only put up 14 15 points per game but that still really hurts you actually because you spent a first round pick on it and other guys are getting 16 points per game wide receiver and they're getting like 13 points per game at running back and you know your your wide receivers are much worse so they're actually kind of way better overall but when you sit down and think through what that looks like for Bijan, he still has like 272 carries in that scenario you know he's still getting a ton of work and uh he's still you know getting used a little bit as a receiver not enough to have a legendary season but but he's used used enough um and then when i went and looked at what that legendary season looks like it's it's hard not to give him almost 400 touches because the falcons run so much and he, this is a really key point. And I, to do this article, I was looking at guys like Brandon Thorne at Established a Run. They, you know, he does awesome offensive line rankings. And that's one of the things when I looked at these 36 seasons since 2000, where we did get that 23 plus points per game in PPR leagues. What do those seasons look like? 
and what do they look like from 2010 on? Um, a lot of a lot of that was interesting because from 2010 on, it was really much more focused on the receiving game. But all across the sample, you really do want high end offensive line play. I mean, it's kind of obvious, right? Like we're looking for guys who can score a ton of touchdowns, be really efficient. So that offensive line play, that truly like elite offensive line, um, especially the run blocking on the offensive line is is massive. And the, the Falcons have a very good offensive line and it's specifically designed to run the ball. Like that is their bread and butter as a whole offense. They were so efficient last year and teams knew they were going to run the ball and they were still super efficient at it. So I think like, when you look at what the Falcons are going to do and what Bijan needs to do, Bijan needs to get like 55% of the Falcons team attempts and he could have over 300 carries. Like that's, you know, if the Falcons are any good at all, like, and then on top of that, I think he can get like 80 targets, 65 receptions, that kind of thing. That's, I identified four plus receptions is kind of this threshold that we want to be hitting that would take him like just under that, but I think it's pretty plausible. And I think he is live to hit four plus receptions per game. If you tack on a really big rushing workload out of the gate, then I think he's got the volume you need. And then it just becomes, can he add the efficiency? Truly, this is one of the best prospects we've seen in, you know, the last 20 years. Like he is, he is an exceptional running back prospect. He's versatile. He has breakaway ability. He is super athletic. He breaks tackles like he's got everything you're looking for from the prospect profile. It's does he get the work out of the gate? Well, I think he will. They're talking him up as a receiver, which I love. They drafted him eighth overall. This is Arthur Smith. This guy wrote Derek. He built his entire offense around Derrick Henry. Like, I think I think he's going to get the work. So, you know, I, I say in the article, we want to be we want to be price sensitive on rookies. And I'm talking about rookies in the first couple rounds. Like I was out on Najee, you know, like that's. And, you know, Najee actually paid off pretty well as a rookie, but that's more the guy. I'm like, I'm a little skeptical of the talent and I have to take him at the one, two turn right away. I, I'm out. But the reason for that is that Saquon Barkley is the only rookie to have one of these legendary seasons in the last since 2000. I think I think Bijan Robinson could pretty easily be the second. It to me, I, I look at it as because he is my RB one. Everybody in my audience knows that he's my RB one. Because again, to your point that we talked about at the beginning of the video, like you shouldn't draft a running back unless they have legendary upside in the early rounds. You're better off taking a Travis Kelsey or one of these top wide receivers or one of the top quarterbacks in the first couple of rounds. The way I look at it is, like you said, the Falcons, not only were they the best run blocking line in the league per PFF last year, it actually wasn't close. Like they were like five or six points higher than the Ravens who were second. Arthur Smith's scheme has elevated bad offensive lines to being great ones like the Tennessee Titans. How good is their offensive line without Arthur Smith right now? It might be the worst offensive line in the entire NFL, even with like when Luan was there and those type of guys. Um, Derrick Henry, prior to Arthur Smith being the offensive coordinator, was splitting a backfield for the most part. He was involved with DeMarco Murray and that kind of thing. Bijan Robinson, he enters a scheme at eighth overall in an offseason where we've seen all of these running backs get traded, tr treated like absolute dirt. They're not getting any money. They're not getting contracts. They're getting franchise tagged. And the Atlanta Falcons said, this running back is so different to the point that we're going to spend a top 10 NFL draft pick on him. And he absolutely is the best running back prospect that I have ever seen in my lifetime. And that includes Saquon Barkley. That includes, you know, some like Adrian. P like, I actually think he's a better prospect than Adrian Peterson. Legitimately, like he's I'm not saying he's going to have the career in the NFL that Adrian Peterson had. But I think he was a better prospect because Peterson had major injury concerns coming out of Oklahoma. So for me, Bijan Robinson, the most versatile, best running back prospect I've ever seen. He enters an offensive scheme that ran the ball 450 times with running backs last year, not including Marcus Mariota with running backs. So if they run 400 times again and he gets 70% of the carries, like we're talking about a guy that has 350 running back uh, carry upside in addition to the fact that he can give you 60, 70 receptions as a receiver on the high end. So even if Tyler Algier and Cordero Patterson, all these guys are involved to some degree, the sheer volume of this rushing offense is such that Bijan can be a 60% opportunity share guy or 70% opportunity share guy and be an absolute workhorse and lead the NFL in touches. And also, this is a scheme that can elevate bad running backs. So you put a great running back or an elite potential running back into it, and we're talking about something that could be absolutely special. The second and fifth most highest DVOA rushing threats last year were a fifth-round rookie running back in Tyler Algier and a 32-year-old and a wide receiver in Cordero Patterson. So 
if they can do that for those guys, what can they do for B. John Robinson? If you look at NFL Next Gen's player tracking metric uh, that uses the, you know, the GPS data, rush yards over expected, um, Caleb Huntley rated really well in that, as did Tyler Algier. Uh, so I completely agree. I, they, this system can elevate basically anybody, and B. John Robinson is going to benefit from that as well while, while adding a lot more talent to the mix. So, you know, one thing I would say too is that when you think through like Bijan Robinson, what kind of the, the conversation about him around the industry, when you look at projections and stuff, I think, you know, projections are a very helpful tool, but they are inherently conservative. They're not going to, you know, reflect all of the high end outcomes because you also have to average in some of the lower end outcomes and kind of historical stuff. Are you really going to project a rookie running back to have 400 touches? That seems nuts. Like no one's going to be comfortable doing that, you know, because it would be such an outlier. But when we're thinking through, okay, I'm shooting for outliers. I'm drafting a running back because I think he can be an outlier. Then B. John Robinson starts to look a little bit more appealing where it's like actually the path to that kind of outlier usage, outlier efficiency behind this incredible offensive line for running the ball with an offense that's designed to do that. Um, it starts to look like very, very plausible. Yeah. The last thing I want to add about the Falcons that we can move off of the Bijan Robinson uh, circle jerk that tends to happen on this channel <laughs> often because I just love this guy so much. And for, I mean, full disclosure, I am a Texas Longhorns fan, so I am a little biased here, but I do think he is an absolutely outstanding prospect. Um, Bijan also, the Falcons have the easiest schedule in the NFL, according to multiple sources, like many sources that I've looked at. The I'm a Buccaneers fan. Trust me, our division's horrid. And the Falcons have a cakewalk. I think they can win 10, 11 games legitimately. Desmond Ritter, all he has to be is, you know, an efficient playmaker, get outside the pocket and make plays when he needs to. London, Pitts, and Bijan might be the best young players, not best players overall, at their positions across the NFL. When we talk about, like, under 23-year-old players at those positions, they might be the best ones. And having those three difference-making talents all healthy would be huge for their offense. So, other than Bijan Robinson, who I, you know, have long, I expected you to say would have a high end legendary upside scenario. My highest rostered running back overall is actually Brees Hall, who you haven't yet written or, you know, done a write up on. I know you're high on Brees Hall. I just want to give uh, the people, you know, an opportunity to hear the Brees Hall sh spiel from somebody other than me. Yeah. So I haven't written up Brees Hall um, as part of this legendary running back scenario because, you know, unfortunately, coming off the ACL tear with Dalvin Cook signing, his ADP is well outside of the first two rounds. You know, occasionally I've extended this article to like cover some people that are kind of on the, the fringe. And I couldn't even do that with Brees Hall. He is not a fringe second round pick this year. Uh, you can get him sometimes in the fifth round. Um, but when I, I have like a screener that I, that I use that um, just kind of helps me start out. It's sort of the base that I, that I'm working on when I'm, when I'm uh, putting these together and, it just looks at the things that I found when looking at those 36 legendary seasons that were kind of the most impactful things like rushing efficiency, receiving efficiency, uh, offensive line quality, offense quality, whether a guy's a second year back weight, I found to be somewhat important because smaller backs have tended to not get used at the goal line. I don't care so much about weight with a guy like Austin Eckler, who I know, you know, they trusted the goal line, but something to keep in mind um, when we don't know yet uh, how many, Opportunities they are getting at the goal line is very important. And Brees Hall is the number one guy in that screener because he was super efficient as a rookie, as a rusher, as a receiver. He got used as a receiver a little bit more than I thought he would. It wasn't to an elite level. But again, in the second year, that's when we actually do see guys get used more. And he had a number of high target games last season and was super efficient as a receiver. Blair Andrews at Rotoviz has done some really good work looking at um, how efficient players actually get more usage in their second seasons. This is why efficiency, I think, is so important. Um, ben Gretsch has had some really good work on, on his sub stack recently about how efficiency and just taking talented players is like becoming an edge again because it's such a volume focused industry right now. Brees Hall flashed the elite unicorn level running back talent that we're looking for. And it didn't come out of nowhere. 
He was a second round pick. He had a very strong prospect profile. He's a super athletic running back. The thing I like about Brees Hall is that when I ever tweet about him or, you know, I say I'm taking him and whatever, I get a lot of responses like, don't you know he tore his ACL? You know, don't you know that it's a two year injury and we, we can't be taking these guys coming off the ACL tears? But when I look at like Edwin Porras from Fantasy Points, he's got, you know, medical expertise and he's saying, I think he's a target. I think he's on track to be back. He won't be 100% in week one, but 100% early on in the season. Then I'm like, I get to bet against an overconfident, you know, overconfident non medical experts talking about ACL tears when I have medical experts. It's not just Edwin. Like I've, I've been, I've dug around. I'm trying to make sure I'm not going crazy here, but it seems like I actually have the medical experts on my side here with the bullish uh, perspective on Brees Hall's recovery. And the way I've been thinking about Brees Hall the whole time, all summer, all off season is this is a late season play. This is a down the stretch play. This is the kind of play that we often make with rookies and we aren't freaked out about it, right? Jonathan Taylor in as a rookie, we're making this bet right now with Jameer Gibbs. I don't think anyone thinks that Jameer Gibbs workload in weeks one through three will be as strong as it is in weeks 14 to 17, right? You're, you're making a late season bet when you take a rookie. Brees Hall's now priced very much like we would price a rookie. And all he has to do is coming out of the week, they have a week seven by Dalvin Cook, who was absolutely horrific in every advanced metric last year, receiving and rushing, and is in a multi-year decline. They're going to get seven weeks to look at him. They're going to get probably seven weeks to look at Brees Hall in comparison to him. They are one of these teams that's constantly citing that Brees Hall's hitting 21 miles an hour when he's jogging and stuff, you know. So I, I honestly think that this thing is going to flip hard to Brees Hall after the week seven bye. And you're going to have the potential to have a running back who is like maybe one of two or three guys that people are actually really excited to put in their starting lineups down the stretch. And I, I think that is just way more valuable than people realize. And it's way easier to get through some of those early season, um, you know, product like you can kind of scrape by. It, it might it might linger on a little longer than I'm saying, and that would really that would hurt. But one out of twelve is still hard to do. You still need to put up a ton of points in the playoffs. You still need to have a guy crushing for you in the championship game. That's ultimately where my focus is, and so I think Brees Hall just just is such a strong bet from that perspective. Yeah, and I mean to Edwin's medical point because he's been on this channel and he's made the Brees Hall argument as well. I'm like you. I'm trying to find a way to to not be 25 percent on Brees Hall, which is my <laughs> underdog exposure to him right now, and I'm buying the dip because, of course, since Dalvin Cook has signed, he's fallen about a round, round and a half of ADP. His example also too is like every non-injury expert thinks that these injuries are black and white, and yeah. they are every running back. It takes them two years, but. Saquon Barkley prior to a freakish ankle injury in 2021 was on his way to getting back to full speed before um, that injury. And that injury kind of hampered him for the rest of the season. And that's of course possible, these compens uh, compensatory injuries and that kind of thing. But when you look at the profile of somebody that could do what Jamal Charles, Adrian Peterson, Edron James, guys that did smash one year removed from an ACL tear, they were young running backs. They were highly athletic. They were highly drafted. They were in good offenses. They were in good situations. Like, Brees Hall does have all the factors that you look for from that perspective. And also, you know, medically he's hit, sounds like he's hitting all his timelines. My I'll paint my, you kind of just painted your legendary scenario. And I'm assuming when you write the article to sound something like that, my legendary scenario is that Dalvin cook is more injured right now than Brees Hall. He had <laughs> shoulder surgery, a chronic injury that, that uh, Edwin Porras has already talked about on our channel. And Dalvin cook, like you said, has already fallen off from a, you know, efficiency standpoint last year. And, by the way, my number one bust heading into the season last year was Dalvin Cook for that reason, because we saw shades of it actually in 2021 as well. Brees Hall has a one to three, one to five week ramp up period where you're splitting a backfield about 50 50 with Dalvin Cook. And then, like you said, the coaching staff realizes, hey, we've ramped up Brees. This was a good safety precaution. It was an incredibly sharp move by the New York Jets to sign Dalvin Cook. Let's just get that clear. It was really sharp because now you don't have to rush Brees Hall back to the yeah. fold. But 
We saw Brees Hall about to smash, maybe have a legendary season last year with Zach Wilson as his quarterback. Like a four-time MVP is a massive upgrade to the situation, to the scoring opportunities of a guy like Brees Hall. So for me, again, I, I'm willing to take the shot in the, you know, most of the time in your guys' home leagues, he's going off the board in the fourth, fifth round. Plan accordingly. Draft a little bit safer elsewhere. Draft an extra running back later, maybe eighth, ninth round. You grab, you know, James Conner or something. Somebody that can get you by early on in the season if Brees Hall is not quite up to full steam. For me, like, again, it's especially when we talk about like best ball tournaments and, you know, late season upside and all the money's at the top. But even in managed leagues, you still want to be having your best team at the end of the year, not at the beginning of the year. A hundred percent. Yeah. And I think, you know, Dalvin Cook, he is still fast. There, There's potential that he's annoying all year and that it kind of just like makes what could be an amazing Brees Hall season into a pretty good Brees Hall season. But I think that you have a couple advantages if you're betting on Brees Hall. Um, one is that sometimes we're like hoping these coaches will like eventually like a guy they don't like. And that's almost never a good bet. But this is not that in my mind. Dalvin Cook won in three years. He was trying to get a long-term contract. He was trying to get more money. He did get like a decent amount of money, but – the whole time, what we kept hearing, and even after they signed Dalvin Cook, like you go look at the Jets beat writers after they signed Dalvin Cook, and they are saying, this is still Brees Hall's team. The coaching staff feels very strongly that Brees Hall is their guy. Dalvin Cook's job is to help get Brees back to the point where they can actually have him be the guy again. So will Dalvin Cook have 60% of the backfield in week one, 70%? Yeah, he might. But that's okay because we're going to have Brees Hall ramping up. That's the whole point of Dalvin Cook. In that split backfield, though, I do still have some optimism for Brees Hall, even you know in week three or week four, because where you see Dalvin Cook having really fallen off over the last couple of years is dealing with contact and success rate. You know, yes, he can still rip off long runs, but that shoulder injury seems to be like changing up the way. He's running a bit. Plus, he's 28 years old. So maybe, you know, he's just not quite as consistent as he used to be. That's That happens to a lot of guys. And he had a worse success rate last year than Ezekiel Elliott. He was, in NFL Next Gen's metrics, he was horrifically bad. That is not going to be conducive to goal line carries. If Dalvin Cook is inconsistent and bad at handling contact, he is very quickly going to be phased out for the back that they already really like in Brees Hall, I think pretty quickly. So Brees Hall... You know, can he score in those first six weeks? Can he score three touchdowns and help help you that way? Yeah, I think he can. Maybe he scores even four. Like, I, I'm actually pretty optimistic about what he can do as kind of a committee back to start the year. Then the big, the bet really will know if it, it worked or not uh, post buy. Yeah. So again, we've talked, I mean, we've talked about the, like I've talked about these guys as having, they're my two highest rostered running backs that are going in the first five rounds. I have Bijan Robinson over 20%, which is crazy for a first round player. And I have Brees Hall at 25%. Other than these guys, um, we can talk about some of the veterans. Of course, you have a number of write-ups already for the top seven guys in ADP and you intend to drop more. Are there any guys that stick out to you as, you know, if somebody listening to this right now is in a home league, they're in a managed league, they should favor, you know, player X over player Y. One that I would say is I would favor Tony Pollard over Nick Chubb and Saquon Barkley. Um, and those are the Barkley one, right? Barkley's kind of the quintessential, like, projections versus let's think through the upside scenarios. And Barkley, the reason that I'm a little bit skeptical when we go from the upside perspective is that he has not been used heavily as a goal line back since his rookie season. Those That goal line workload really hasn't been there. He is not behind a very good offensive line. Probably not like a terrible offensive line, but it's, I think they're going to struggle with consistency all year. But Saquon Barkley has been a very kind of boom-bust rusher. And I don't know that, you know, although there's no other back to really compete for him, compete with him for those goal line carries. It's not like they're going to bring in Eric Gray at the goal line or something like it will be Saquon's role, but I think they'll pass a decent amount. Um, I think Daniel Jones will be used a little bit as a rusher. They've got like a mid, a million kind of gadget type of guys, you know, when one, whenever Wandale gets back, but Paris Campbell until then, like they can do some 
kind of tricky stuff around the goal line, which again makes more sense uh, when you don't have that elite offensive line or a running back who's just like super, super consistent. So that concerns me a little bit. And then the other thing that's kind of interesting about Saquon is that he had 91 receptions as a rookie, but then he hasn't really been that receiving weapon, not at the level of, you know, an Eckler or McCaffrey, like not even really close. He's not hitting the, that four plus receptions per game. And I'm not sure that he's going to this year. You know, they, they upgraded the weapons with Waller and uh, with drafting Jalen Hyatt, and they brought in a number of slot receivers. Like they've got other options in the passing game. I, I think it was a bad sign that in his first year where they really didn't have like anybody, he still wasn't at the level of receptions that you'd want. And in his silent killer scenario, I gave him more receptions than he had last year. I gave him a ton of carries. It still left you just kind of feeling like, what? I just don't really have a guy I'm excited about here. He can get there. He certainly can get there. But I would rather bet on a guy like Tony Pollard, who is showing that electric ability at 26 years old. They're both 26. So you're either way, you're betting on a bit of an older back than we'd like. But Pollard was scoring from distance last year as a receiver, as a rusher. And Ezekiel Elliott had almost two green zone opportunities per game last year. That's the workload. That's the threshold that I use. Two green zone opportunities per game is what we're looking for for these legendary seasons. Zeke had that almost to himself last year. Pollard just had one. If he takes like half of Zeke's workload or a little more, he's there with that goal line work. I guess maybe Rico Dowdle or someone could be their goal line back, but I think it's pretty likely that Pollard gets a decent amount of that work because he was really consistent as a rusher last year. His success rate was really good last year and in 2021. He's shown that electric, explosive rushing ability, but he's also shown consistency, reliability, the type of stuff that actually does, I think, help coaches trust a guy. Like, I don't think they're looking at NFL next-gen success rate metric, but they're watching tape and seeing, is this guy doing what he's supposed to do on a regular basis? And I think Pollard actually does that a little bit more than he probably gets credit for as kind of this slightly undersized speed back. So, it's definitely a little bit of a projection, a little bit of a, a leap of faith, I'll say, with Pollard. But it's the type of leap of faith, faith I want to make because I feel very confident in his ability. I think he's he is behind a good offensive line. And we just saw this a couple of years ago with Austin Eckler, where it's like, hey, I don't know. Is he really going to get the touchdowns? If he does get the touchdowns, he'll crush. But I don't know. He did, you know, and I think Pollard, it actually reminds me a lot of that. It's like if they just do the logical thing and use this guy at the goal line instead of some random back, then he's going to have an awesome season. Um, he, partly because he's just got that electric ability as a receiver and a rusher that I'm starting to feel nervous that maybe Saquon doesn't quite have any more to that level. He, he had 5.9 yards per reception last year, which is quite poor. His rushing efficiency has not been very good. So at this point, I'm at, I'm betting on Pollard for efficiency. And I'm betting on him over Chubb as well because I don't think Chubb has the level to get to like anywhere close to the four-plus receptions per game. I expect that he'll be used more as a receiver, but he has so far to go. That was one of the things that when I was looking at the legendary scenarios, like, man, this guy just, yeah, he'll be used more, but more than what? He just has not been used at all as a receiver in recent years. Yeah, with Chubb, I mean, he probably has to crush on the goal line and crush with big plays on the back of maybe yeah. Deshaun Watson playing like 2020 Deshaun Watson. That's kind of his like super, super high ceiling scenario. So I do still like Chubb, but of course, you know, you have to make the decision point between Chubb and CeeDee Lamb and Amon Ross St. Brown and Garrett Wilson, those top end wide receivers going at the end of the first round, maybe even Travis Kelsey if you guys are in leagues where running backs are pushed up the board. I think there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, Saquon, they, they, it's also the same scheme that that saw no Buffalo Bills running back ever get used on the goal line, right? Like it was always Josh Allen. Daniel Jones is going to eat into that workload. And then, like you said, Saquon Barkley just hasn't been used that way. And then also, too, his receiving upside that we saw as a rookie, that was with Eli Manning. Like, I mean, Eli Manning was washed at that point. He just checked down like crazy, similar to what we saw with Ben Roethlisberger and Najee Harris. Yep. We might never see yep. that again for Najee Harris either. So Sometimes when you have a completely immobile, can't walk quarterback, like that's what happens. And we even last year too, we saw Jonathan Taylor get more receiving upside than he usually had with, with Matt Ryan. So keep in mind, like who the quarterback is too. Cause like mobile quarterbacks will, you know, impact uh, a receiving upside for a running back. So 
I want to wrap this up because we're, you know, going on 45 minutes here. So um, was there anything else you wanted to mention or, or should we kind of wrap this thing up? Like when can we expect maybe, you know, the ETN and Gibbs of the world to kind of get featured here or uh, whatever the case is. So I'm in the process of, of moving to San Diego, which is, which is kind of a uh, moving from Brooklyn to San Diego. So it's, it's uh, kind of impacted my writing schedule slightly, uh, but I am hoping to get that out uh, next week. So I need to, uh, I need to, figure out, get my time machine fired back up and go write those scenarios. But um, that'll probably be out next week. I think I'll be doing that one as kind of a free preview with uh, some of behind the paywall. Um, if people do want to sign up, uh, I know you've got a, a deal going with Underdog. Um, if you sign up for a yearly membership, you can get a $50 uh, credit to Underdog, uh, even if you're an existing Underdog user. So it's a pretty sweet deal that I have right now kind of a, on a limited time until I run out of a, a set amount of underdog credits they gave me. So if you're looking to sign up, check out the other stuff I got on there and read the the full article that I'll have as a follow up to this um, details on that uh, on the homepage of the site. But yeah, the uh, the article completely free. I, I go through scenarios on Derrick Henry as well. Christian McCaffrey, Austin Eckler. Um, it's pretty, pretty interesting years we talked about for running back. Yeah, for sure. And all that will be linked down below, of course. Uh, like Pat just made reference to, if you guys want to sign up on Underdog Fantasy, you can get our draft guide and our weekly start sit rankings for free. If you sign up with 10 bucks using the promo code FSE, then you go check out Pat's work, sign up for his yearly membership. You'll get a $50 credit on top of the $100 or 100% deposit match you'll get by using our code. So a lot of value packed in at the end of this video. Again, if you guys want that, that'll be linked down below in the pinned comment and in the description as well if you want to get offers for those kinds of things. Again, appreciate you guys for sticking around to the end of this video. It was a little longer than I wanted to go, but I thought you know we were in a good flow there. I didn't want to disrupt it. Um, if you made it to the end, of course, hammer the like button, subscribe to the channel if you are new. Unbelievable support that we've seen over the course of the last, I don't know, two weeks or so. We've uh, you know gone up, I don't know, 6,000 subscribers, closing in on wow. 30,000 right now. So really, really appreciate the support that you guys have hit over here. And again, make sure to check out Pat's article. It is totally free. There's a ton of value on his site also uh, available. Like we said, those, those um, offers that you can get them, but this article is free. So if you want to check it out, definitely go give him uh, a look up there. Um, but yeah, and also, you know, his Twitter's on the screen. If you want to follow him over there again, the best ball mania three winner, by the way. So if you don't believe anything that I say, I had a comment yesterday. It was like, what the fuck do you know? You've never won shit in fantasy football. It's like, I mean, Pat's won quite a bit in fantasy football, so maybe you should value his opinion. If he, you know, if he likes the upside scenario for Bijan and for Brees Hall, maybe I kind of know what I'm talking about a little bit. So um, with that being said, peace out. We'll talk to you soon.